This is Soon News TV, and you're listening to the iWeekly Show. Welcome to the iWeekly Show, the premier place for news, headlines, and analysis on all things iRacing, the premier online racing simulator. I'm your host, as always, Mr. Hashtag Do You Mind himself, Jake Sperry, bringing you the rundown on all things iRacing for the next half an hour. Make sure that you leave a like, a share, a subscribe, or whatever it is that you need to do in order to help make us grow here. It's fantastic to see how sim racing is starting to take off. And straight into the news, the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series from Spa-Francorchamps. Well, that was a very straightforward race uh, in the end, shall we say. Because for those of you who were expecting a shock, there was no shock. Martin Kronke has gone nine races now in a row this season. Unbeaten, ten unbeaten in a row overall, and Martin looks like he is the most unstoppable man in sim racing. He should become sim racing's poster boy, and has proven yet again that if anyone wants to come and challenge Martin Kronke for any title in any vehicle, you've got to go through him first, and nobody has that innate ability right now. He took 10 seconds on his teammate, uh, Mitchell De Jong, he put 25 seconds on uh, Freak Show Thorst, and he put 50 seconds on Bono House at Spa, which is amazing. I in reality, it's just amazing to see just how far uh, Kronke is pushing the boat out. He was four tenths quicker in qualifying than anybody else in extremely hot conditions. And it may be a case of it, when and not if for this title now. Three races to go in the season. He's got himself uh, 59 points, I believe it is, of a margin. He can win it at Suzuka, but most likely he'll have to wait for his home race at the Nürburgring. But he's doing a brilliant job. And no one really getting close will feel like they have a legitimate opportunity. And that will even come down to World's Fastest Gamer, where drivers aren't going to be giving it a shot where otherwise they would because of the fact that Martin Kronke is so dominant and the moment he steps into a race, uh, oh, oh wait, he's going to win by like a minute or something like that. So so this is where we hit a catch-22 in sim racing. It's sort of the Gregor Hutu thing of, oh, Gregor wins everything, so we're not going to be in a situation where we want to race anymore because Gregor Hutu's just going to win. The issue is for any series to want to develop or want to go forward, it, any series needs to find a way of making competition. And I think Kronke only once this season, and that was at Monza, was ever in a situation where he actually needed to fight for his position. From there, yes, he had the poor qualifying at Sebring, but he got to lead by the end of the first corner. And then went away. You know, at Indianapolis, he had to wait behind for 10, 11 laps. But then he made the move and he pulled away. To stop Martin Kronke is one thing. To beat Martin Kronke is most certainly another thing. So, in terms of what needs to happen in, in, in iRacing for the World Championship, Kronke's got to lose at some stage. For it to be exciting again. Don't get me wrong. Martin Kronke's achievement of going 10 straight wins. It's sensational. You can't do any better than what Martin Kronke is doing at the moment. But because he's doing so well. There is a knock on an adverse effect. Because he is Mr. iRacing at the moment. He is the guy who is nailing it every single time. With that said, his championship rival Bono House had, uh, quite simply, a shocking qualifying, starting ninth. Um, I think that it's not often that you talk about Bono starting ninth uh, 
it's, it's difficult. I think the worst result he's had all season is a 10th place at Road America. I think that Bono has a lot of weight on his shoulders right now, being labelled as one of these drivers going with a free, sp- with a free seat, shall I say, into the Irishing World, ch- uh, into the world's fastest gamer, even. And to get into world's fastest gamer, it's always going to be a massive, massive platform. And for Bono, I think that it's starting to have a bit of an adverse effect on his performance because of the fact that he maybe isn't putting in as much time as he thought he would be. You'd think that Bono House needs to prove himself and needs to start finding victories over Martin Cronkay. Yes, it's his debut season, but to be stuck behind Isaac Price for as long as he did, to have that contact which may come back to bite him at Suzuka, to be in a situation where Bono probably needs to just calm down and choose one or the other. The title is pretty much secured. Bono, once that title is secured, can then go and focus on world's fastest gamer and trying to get that seat. But by the same point, if Martin Cronke gets that seat from iRacing, what's to say Bono gets that seat when it comes to the finals of that? We still don't know what those finals are, but what we do know is that when it comes down to Gregor versus Bono versus Martin, and it's not a formality that Martin's in that seat, and I'll make that abundantly clear, the big thing that has to be looked at in this situation is, is Bono going to beat Gregor on R-Factor? Yes. Is he going to beat him on iRacing? Some of the time, yes. But can you beat Martin Kronke on iRacing right now? And that's a no. And... I think that's really, really telling that Bono is now starting to struggle with his results. I think that there is a lot of pressure on him. He's still young. He's got five FSR World titles. He's got the world's uh, he's got the Visa Vegas E race under his belt. Bono's the it man, and you feel that Bono's the it man that all the marketing tells you. Cronkay's the it man when it comes to the actual racing. So. You know, for Bono, he just needs to calm down, assess his priorities, and then work out from there. It's that simple. Um, But then talking about all those drivers lower down who are maybe not racing, Alexis Yakala, Peter Berriman, Joni Tamala, uh, Riley Preston, all those drivers. See four of those names. I know Riley's a little bit different, but to see uh, those sorts of names uh, hovering around the top 20. Graham Cowles, another one. Patrick Holtzman, another one. Drivers who are incredibly fast and can pretty much hold it with any of the big boys at any given time. To see all of those drivers seemingly look like they're going to drop out of the world championship positions, there's an element of surprise. It's the it's the, it's the Iberica feeling from last season where you had Pablo Gopro Lopez and all of the others go in that last season. And Inex are having the same thing. Um, Alexis Yakala hasn't raced for a very long time. Peter Berriman, I think, is a little bit frustrated. Uh, it, it's, it, it's difficult when you have so many quick drivers and that one moment where sim racing becomes or is getting to become bigger and... You see so many drivers who seemingly can't cut it or are busy doing something else. Michael Dinkle's another one who's completely dropped off the face of the earth having a sabbatical. You look at sim racing right now. Yes, there is a new crop. Yes, other drivers can come in and take seats and race and race incredibly quickly. But at the same point, you have to understand that sim racing is a very difficult thing to get into and you can't be half-hearted when you make it to the big time because that just means that those drivers in the mid-pack who maybe aren't as deserving get more time keep themselves in play and it's it's one of my gripes when someone doesn't perform to their expectation that if they have so much more they can offer they just need a, a friendly 
push forward to do exactly what they need to do. You know, I wouldn't put in a 20% effort on any broadcast. So why should a driver put in 20% effort on a race? That's just my thinking anyway. But drivers may be coming out of the top 30. There may be reforms to the system. The uh, Road to Pro qualifying actually came out for all three of the championships being the Irish World Championship, NASCAR Picante Free Series, and Blanc Pan. So uh, I did manage to save uh, the picture somewhere. And I do say somewhere very, very loosely in this situation because although that you get yourself all these races that happen, you look at a calendar for... The NASCAR, which is basically exactly the same as it was last time, has a road race on the undroppable weeks, which is a little bit odd. Um, and you also have a situation where the Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series and the Road to Pro will always be very hard fought. So we got a lot going on. And on that segue, we're going to go to the NASCAR Peak Antifree Free Series, which happened on Tuesday. It came from Michigan, the last of the regular season, and Michael Conti taking a victory. Now, it's been a while since we've seen Michael Conti up at the top. Uh, he was robbed of a victory at Watkins Glen last year. Uh, it's taken him a while to get back, but he gets a win at Michigan when he really needed it. But ultimately, he would fall short. He's only P9 overall, so he misses out on the chase. And for Michael Conti, you'd feel that he just didn't get his season going to begin with. And his opportunity now is starting to fall back. And Conti, a driver who was up there fighting for titles two, three years ago, is now on the cusp or, or is missing getting into that chase. There are drivers there who are incredibly consistent week on week on week, who don't put in those podium finishes, who don't get those who get in and around that top five. Drivers like Marcus Richardson and Corey Vincent. And these drivers get through on their consistency, but you'd think that, you know, that they were good, solid drivers. Drivers who are inconsistent now in the NASCAR Peak Antifree Series don't get in, don't win titles. You know, you're not in a situation anymore where you can sit P1 at the top of the race and win the first three rounds and then sit back in P25 for the next three rounds and still expect to be top or second so much more difficult than that and that's been proven this season the level has certainly increased with loser and Zelensky. uh loser wasn't racing our wasn't racing Zelensky only managed the top 10 and Z and zach novak is another driver who is arguably the informed man heading at just the right time heading into the chase because he's got a win at indianapolis he's got a second place here at michigan and when it comes to the chase i think zach novak will be in that final because he is proving at just the right time, he's got this great turn of pace at the moment, and having that massive turn of pace, having momentum, is something that really helps benefit you week on week on week. And with only a two-week turnover between all these races, you know, I, I think Zach Novak has got it sussed out right now. He knows that he's got to be incredibly consistent week on week on week on week. And he did that consistency game. But when he needed to pick up and he needed to secure his place, and he needed to show some form that he is a force to be reckoned with, he has picked his game up. And at Indianapolis and Michigan, two very different circuits in contrast. He's He's got and proved it. And now at the final four circuits, uh, or the next three circuits, that it's going to be rather, shall I say, and those circuits, if I can just get them up right now, will be Darlington, Chicago, Land, and Dover. Very similar in design for these first round playoffs, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him in that final with an automatic win. I, I think that with four going into the final, uh, I think the four that we're going to be seeing is Loser, Zelensky, Alfala, and then Zach Novak. Uh, not surprising, see, as they are the top four in the championship at the moment. But, you know, there are drivers who are doing very well. Logan Clampett has been very good this season. Consistent, needing to maybe find a little bit more pace overall. 
I think Corey Vincent's done very well. Marcus Richardson's had a very good debut to the season. And there is very, very good talent in NASCAR this year. And I hope that there's going to be more great talent next year in NASCAR. And there is always going to be a very, very deep talent pool uh, that is available. And I think that there is a lot of potential to move forward for some of these NASCAR guys. I think they've done a very, very good job. So there's my five minutes of not knowing what I'm talking about in in, in NASCAR because I, I don't watch it consistently and I'll keep saying that every single time NASCAR pops up. But a season, a series that we did see crop up and it's a brand new World Tour event that happened this weekend. Uh, we had the uh, Cal GT Road America 500 happen. Uh, so Cam Walsh, legitimately went ecstatic after he heard it. Um, the Nissan GTX GTP uh, had the Audi GTO, so GTP and GTO. And it was a good race. Cake Shubay of Hoitzingvel Core Motorsports getting what is a win that kickstarts Hoitzingvel Core Motorsports back into what has been a very poor season. And the fact that they've got this victory proves that Hoitzingvel Core Motorsports know exactly what they need to do at any given moment. They had a great 2016. They announced themselves on the world stage. They took it to pure at VLN. They were a point away from Blancpain. This season, they dropped the ball. And it's about a rebuilding process. And on a brand new World Tour event where they put Keiko Shubi in one car, Alexander Voss in one car, and someone else in another. I think it was uh, Fantini or whatever his name is. Uh, they proved that they had pace in GTP, and they won convincingly. Alexander Voss crashed out on lap eight. Uh, Cake Shuve went lights to flag with one incident with lap traffic, which he was very lucky not to get damage on. But for Cake Shuve, he's been a driver who is quick, maybe hasn't shown all that he can do over 2017, he's getting back to where he was, where he is starting to become a little bit unstoppable. Had a good fight with Beneke in VLN. And here he was very easily unchallenged and took a win by over 25 seconds. Go catch Kei Kashube. But at the same time, on that opening lap, some of the regulars like Keith Ritchie, um, Tapani Lin Luoto, Alex Q, all of them ran into... A very heavy incident at turn number three. Um, it was a very controversial incident between uh, Stars and Stripes, uh, which was Keith Ritchie, and Juani Lopez of the Vendaval Sim Racing Team. Uh, I've had a look at the incident again, and there is an element of squeezing uh, on the driver of Juani Lopez, but at the same time, Juani Lopez is going for a gap in a position that wasn't necessarily decisive. So... In terms of that incident, I'd call it a racing incident between the two of them. But in terms of that race, it did alter a little bit the prototype division and space it out quite a little bit. Fair props, I have to go to William Levesque of Inex, of Inex Racing there for that race because what he did in the final few laps to challenge for position three, I think it was, and then position two, was just beautiful to watch. I think he did a very good job at getting P3. And, you know, hats off. You've done a very good job about it. But GTO was always going to be very exciting. We had a great battle at the top between the Campbell-Liano team and also the team of MSP. I think that with, I believe it's ex Glacier Joni Hagner and Mika Ruscola against the team of Lucas Jedstat or the driver of Lucas Jedstat. I thought it was a fantastic battle all throughout the opening stint. Uh, it's a shame that that battle came to an end early. I think that there is a lot more that can happen from that GTO division. It's a fantastic division of battling that we saw from it. And ultimately, I think that Joni Hagner has proved that he's not past his prime. He can still go he can score some vital results it's a shame what happened with the lap traffic because if it wasn't for that they'd be battling all the way towards the end and even the battle for p2 towards the end was very interesting between Ove uh Trengaride and also Joni Takanen who's now joined Coanda Simsport which is a stunning move for the driver of Yoni Takanen 
So, heartbreak for Ove. He gets taken out on the final lap by a heavily, heavily damaged GTP. And you do have to feel that Ove would have been that driver who really made a difference and would have been one of those feel-good moments. Oh, look at him. He's got P2. We hadn't really heard too much about him, but he's done so well. And people do like an underdog. And I think Ove was that underdog in that field of GTO. And it is a shame to see exactly what happened. But, you know, it is sim racing. It does happen and you have to go forward and you have to hope that everything works out in your favour. Now, something cropped up in this broadcast. Something cropped up on the iRacing forums. And I don't know the bloke who it is because I haven't decided to look at the forums. But the rumour going around is apparently there's an MP45 uh, McLaren heading to iRacing. No, there isn't. No, there isn't. I hate to burst your bubble, but the fact that a broadcaster talks about a vehicle that they would like to see, and then you put it in quotation marks as being confirmed, not only that, but taking another broadcaster's uh, clip without permission, A, copyright strike, B, uh, attention-seeking. C, don't do it. And it goes to anyone. Like, if iRacing wants to confirm something, they'll confirm something. There's no proof of MP45. We didn't even confirm it in the broadcast that there would be an MP45 coming. We would say it would be nice if an MP45 was there. We never said that it is coming or anything like that. So please, have restraint. And please just don't go off on your merry tandem and say that something's happening when very clearly it isn't. But something that is happening, which isn't involved with iRacing, that I have to talk about, which broke to me this morning. Formula One have decided to go into esports. And I think that this is the day that sim racing changes. This intention... When Formula E decided they wanted to get in for a million dollars, we went, no, really? Oh, it's happening. Oh, oh, okay. And from there, we had a, a little bit of a shambles. But what what I think that they did very well, um, that Formula E did, is that they opened the door for everyone else to jump into sim racing. Sim racing was... A commodity and a very hot commodity as well, especially in the corporate world of motor racing, because they're seeing all these brilliant battles that are going online. They go, oh, look, if they're going for it, then why don't we go for it? And just in the space of eight months, in the space of eight months, what we have seen is world. Um, we have seen uh, the Visa Vegas e-race take place on January 6th. We've seen, uh, we've seen ESL pick up project cars. And promote sim racing on arguably one of the grandest stages of them all. We've seen uh, the World Touring Car Championship look to try and make their name in um, one of the sims. I believe it's Race Room that they've gone to. We've seen the likes of World's Fastest Gamer, which is arguably the biggest tournament ever in sim racing. I think for a one-year contract. I think McLaren have beaten the curve. And now with the announcement that F1 2017, the brand new game coming out, is going to have an eSports World Championship in October, I think that the needle has been pushed that bit further. And while I think it is a very good thing that Formula One has decided to jump into the eSports realm, this is the most classic of classic cases of the double-edged sword. Because it is very easy to get yourself carried away and say that F1 is amazing. And, and and the same point has to go contrast the other way. It's very easy to go F1 is awful for doing this. And while sim racing in itself hasn't been the most reliant on F1, I think that what F1 is going to do is change the landscape. Without a shadow of a doubt, Liberty Media are going to change the landscape with this tournament. The idea already, uh, as I look at the motorsport.com article, is that they are going to 
have the top 20 or 40 quickest drivers in qualifying, which will go to a top 20 semi-finals from the Gfinity Arena. And then the finals will take place as part of the Abu Dhabi closing in November. So by November, we will already see a first ever Formula One world, eSport World Champion. And they will be immortalized into the next game. They'll get an automatic seat into the semi-finals. And it all sounds quite nice. But although it sounds quite nice, for all the other sims, be it R-Factor, iRacing, Automobilista, Race Room, uh, Assetto Corsa, this is the big get your head above the precipice moment. This is the moment where sim racing is now about to snowball. And this is where... I call it first. Sim racing from here on in, on the 21st of August 2017, snowballs into a global commodity. It doesn't get as big as Dota, League of Legends, uh, StarCraft, CSGO, or any of those. But sim racing now has the portal and the platform to get itself on that level. Doing something very similar to what FIFA's doing right now, they are, Formula One is pushing the agenda and going, we are the biggest series in the world in terms of racing. And we have been for 50, 60 years. Now it's our time, as we head towards 70 years, to look at a new generation and go, yes, I think that we can do this. And I think that we need to look at sim races because ultimately they are the strongest breeding ground for new drivers because that's true the question of if it's uh, in quotations good for sim racing yes it is because it gives massive exposure to our entire community as a whole whoever makes that top 40 be it that we know them or we don't know them be it that harry jacks noble 2909 gets through which arguably he has to win because of his world's fastest game seat he has to go and win it be it that, be it anything else, it's good for sim racing because of the exposure. What's bad for sim racing, though, with this event is quite a few things. Because at the same point of it being good, it's getting your name out. It is being done to give Formula One a name. And that's something crucial. It is still a very corporate thing. I think they've done it better than what Formula E have done it, where they're not including their own drivers. But ultimately, they are doing a good thing because getting your name out is good for sim racing. Now, when it comes to prize money, I would not be surprised to see a six-figure sum battered about. And to see a six, if there is a six-figure sum battered about, I have seen nothing on official prize money or something like that. If there's a six-figure sum being battered about, then sim racing has to be worried. Formula E batted the seven-figure sum way too early. Because they batted that seven-figure sum early, they put a lot of pressure on themselves, and then they fell flat on their face. And arguably, some say they put us back five years. I say they put us back five months, is, is the reality of it. I say they put us back five months from January over into May. And then from May onwards, we got better and better, world's fastest gamer, uh, and then this. But Formula 1 now hold all the cards in sim racing. Because if they get it right on this, and they make a really successful event, they uh, showcase off sim racing the best, and they get people invested because they're going to have the most media coverage on it, then sim racing snowballs. And because Formula 1 wants to make that snowball, every other sim now has to put prize money in. The day of the five-figure sum is over right now. And the 20Ks that iRacing's batting around, the 3Ks that FSR are batting about, they're good. But right now, when it comes right down to it, the only saving grace for all esports right now is the fact that it's a one-off tournament with a semi-final and a final and qualifying the saving grace, it's not, a t it's not a championship season across the year. And if it was a championship season across the year, then sim racing could very easily 
have gone backwards. The saving grace would have been there were, there were only 20 positions. But ultimately, for sim racing, for the future of sim racing, this is the snowball moment. This is where sim racing now needs to go from 20k to 50k. And in two years, sim racing has to be hitting six-figure sums. Because if they're not, then any sim that's not hitting a six-figure sum becomes irrelevant. Be it Formula 1, be it Formula E, be it whatever series you want to throw at it, be it a tournament that some nobody has designed, be it the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series, or Formula Sim Racing, or GPVWC, if you can't get it to six figures within two years, you're irrelevant. And on that note, Tuesdays at 6, we'll try and get you out. You can find us on iTunes, you can find us on YouTube. Uh, make sure that you uh, tw uh, tweet any questions that you have to me at Jake underscore Sperry. Sperry spelled S-P-A-R-E-Y. And or you can look at at iWeeklySN. Make sure you subscribe for more content. I've been hashtag Do You Mind Jake Sperry. And this was the iWeekly Show.